Okay, this is our last mini lecture for lecture series 11. And in this mini lecture, we're going to just tiptoe into some concepts related to explicit memory, specifically episodic memory and semantic memory. Now, episodic memory is your memory for episodes of your life. It's, I think of episodes as like um, uh, a soap opera, right? Each episode is some other part of some person's life. So episodic memory is our memory for episodes in our life. It's personally experienced information. Semantic memory is our long-term memory for facts and figures and statistics and knowledge that is generally known. So your knowledge that this is a lecture for a Psychology 367 course, that's semantic. Your memory of your experiences that you felt when you were watching the last lecture, that would be episodic memory. Remember patient KC, Kent Cochran, who had the motorcycle accident? He was a, a particularly important patient for the study of explicit memory because patient KC had amnesia for episodic memory, but retained his semantic memory. So he could remember facts. He had been an engineer, so he could tell you all about how to change a, a tire on a car, but he could not remember having ever changed a tire on a car. He could remember the rules for playing chess, but he could not personally remember an episode in which he played chess. So there was, there was a selective damage to the parts of the brain that underlie episodic memory. So what's important about patient KC is that he demonstrated to us that in long-term memory, episodic and semantic memories seem to rely on largely different brain areas. All right, let's talk about episodic memories. Why is it that two people can experience the same episode, the same event, that they were both present at and remember that event so differently. Well, there's a lot of different reasons for that. One is your understanding of the event. How I remember an episode of my life depends on the meaning of that episode for me in the context of my life. And another person will have a memory, an episodic memory of that event that's driven by the meaning that they attributed at the time to that event, okay? So differences in how people understand an event, differences of the importance of that event for a particular individual. Maybe with a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend, you remember every detail about the first date and your partner doesn't remember the first date at all and you're thinking, oh my God, what, were you there? <laughs> how could this happen? Details might have been more important for you than for your partner. Okay. There's also something interesting called the egocentric bias. And we'll talk about the, the narcissism of memory later in the semester. But basically, your memory systems are designed to remember best what you do. So it turns out that our memory is much better for the things that we do than for the things, the actions that other people do or perform. Um, everybody's mood at the time of an event is going to change how they remember the event. If one person is terrified, they're going to remember that event very differently than the other person who might have been having a good time. They're going to remember the event differently. Um, one of the things that's, that's complicated about memories and trying to get at the issue of what's an accurate memory, and that's a complicated question, is reminiscing. Are people remembering the actual event itself, or are they remembering how they felt the last time they recalled that memory? 
That's a tricky thing that cognitive psychologists haven't been able to really tease apart yet. Um, there's also a weird gender effect, at least now. Hopefully this will go away. But right now, in a lot of countries, there's something called a negative recall bias. Women are much more likely to remember their mistakes than men are. I don't know why, but there you go. So how can you be in a relationship with someone if the events that you experience together are remembered so differently based on the meaning, your mood, the perspective, all of this? Well, um, professor at UCLA, Andrew Christensen, has a book just on this called Reconcilable Differences. And his suggestion to couples is that you give up on the idea of, you know, he said, she said. No, you said you would take out the garbage every Tuesday. Like, no, I said I would help you take out the trash. I didn't mean to assume complete responsibility, right? Those kinds of disagreements. Give up on the idea that there is one right memory of an event and that all other memories of that event are wrong. And just accept that there's always multiple versions of the same event. Um, now, it could be that two people disagree about an event because one of them is lying. And we know people lie all the time. But it is also entirely possible that two people could disagree about their memories of an event just because we remember things differently, right? It doesn't have to be an intentional lie. It could be an entirely unintended consequence of the fact that we remember things relative to our own context. So uh, Christensen's best advice for couples is focus on the truth of the emotions, what you were feeling at the time of the event, and not who said what word. Okay, focus on the emotions. All right. I also want to talk to you about a very cool phenomenon in memory called meta memory. This is super important for students. Meta memory is your understanding or your knowledge of your own memory systems. I should go back and say that there's a larger umbrella term called metacognition. And that's essentially your knowledge of how your various cognitive processes work, right? So for example, I'm a very spatial person, um, very visual. You probably notice that from my slides, they don't contain a lot of words. My knowledge of myself as being a more spatial visual person and less of a language text-based person is metacognition. I also know that I have a heck of a time with certain kinds of memory, and that is meta memory. So knowing about how my own memory systems work, knowing how I learn best and when I learn best and what I learn best, or that I knew something. So for example, I know that my memory is really good in the morning, and if I work out, it's great after a workout. That's meta memory. The power of being a student and frankly of being a good partner in a relationship is this meta memory. Not just knowing what you're good at, but knowing what you're bad at. Not just knowing what you remember, but what you forget. Um, the great quote from Confucius that says, real knowledge is to know the extent of one's own ignorance. And it turns out that at least in the US, we're terrible about knowing the extent of our own ignorance. We uh, experience or demonstrate overconfidence all the time. Now you guys know enough about statistics to know that if I say 50% uh, of the world is above, the average height of people in the world is, I don't know, five and a half feet, that it's going to have a normal distribution, so half the people in the world will be taller than five and a half feet, and half the purple people in the world will be shorter than five and a half feet. The same thing goes with driving ability, right? There's an average driver, 50% of people drive better than the average, and 50% of people drive worse than the average. So if you asked people, are you a better than average driver, half the people should say yes, and half the people should say no.
And that's not what happens. What you, when you ask people, are they better than average drivers? You don't get 50% of them saying yes. You get 93% of people think they're better than average drivers. 93%. That means 43% of people are just deluded, right? They have terrible awareness of their own driving abilities. So you gotta be watch out for those people. Um, 84% of French men think that they are above average lovers, should be 50%. But I think the biggest bias is within university professors. A study was done at the University of Nebraska amongst faculty, and uh, they asked the faculty, forget about the top 50%, are you in the top quartile? Are you in the top 25%? And almost 70% of faculty think they're in the top 25% um, of professors. Yikes. So these are biased metacognition. But there's a bias in metacognition that's really important for anybody taking an exam to know. Um, and this is based on work um, that came out of uh, David Dunning's lab at Cornell University. And what he did was super simple. Go into a classroom where students are taking a test. And as they finish the test and they leave, ask them, how'd you do on the test? Do you think you got an A or a B? What grade do you think you got on that test? And how, um, how much mastery do you think you had of the material? So we did that for each of the students. And then he went back and compared people's estimates for how well they would have done on the exam with their actual grades on the exam, okay? And the results were startling and got a lot of attention. Um, if people were perfect, right? If everybody knew how well they had performed, how well they knew the material, how well they performed on the exam, then the data should lie along this uh, diagonal line. But the arrows show you where there's a big gap, where there's a big difference, a big bias, a big disconnect between how well somebody thinks they did on an exam and how well they actually did. And the bias is much bigger with some people than with others. So what uh, Dunning did was to take the data and break it up into quartiles. So the top 25% of students, the bottom 25% of students, and the two middle 25% of students. So that's why there's just four dots on each line. For students who were in the lower half of the class, their overconfidence was huge, right? So students in the bottom quartile thought they had earned a, a grade of about 60%. Actually, the percent correct on that exam was 10. The difference between 60% and 10% is crazy big, right? They were super overconfident. Uh, if you look at not the bottom quartile, but the next quartile up, you still get a gap of about 40%. People thought that they got eh, 65%. In effect, they only got about 35% correct. Uh, the people in the, not the top 25%, but the next to top 25%, their estimates were pretty good. They still were overconfident, but a much smaller degree. And then look at the students at the top quartile. They underestimated their performance. And I see this with the top students all the time. They walk out of an exam going, oh, I just blew it. And then they get an A. Um, so this is an example, especially with the bottom 25% of a class. If <laughs> this is a problem, right? If you think you know the material and you don't, then you're going to have horrible surprises at the end of every exam and quiz. Um, I mean, I get that in students in our class too, right? They'll write to me after a, a quiz or an exam and say, hey, I knew the material, but I failed the exam. I don't get it. Well, look at this graph, folks. There's a metacognition or a meta memory problem there. You did not know the material as well as you thought you did. Um, and how does that, what do, you, what do you do about it if you're a student? Well, you have to know the difference between the knowledge that you know and the knowledge that you don't know. 
You don't need to study what you already know. It makes you feel good, but it's a waste of your time. You already know that material. You have to figure out what is it that you don't know. And then once you figure out what it is you don't know, you need to separate that into two groups further. There's one group of, of issues that is too complicated for you to know now because you don't have the, the foundational information. What you want to study is what you can learn now but don't know. That requires metacognition, metamemory, and it's a very important skill for students to develop, which is why I give practice questions. Not so you can just jump through hoops and be done with my class, but so that you can develop metacognition skills. You need them in life. You need them in life. That's it for lecture series 11. Thanks everybody. Students, back to Canvas. Bye-bye.